webinar to go through and um, uh, go through some of the questions. And uh, I and the other moderators will uh, keep an eye on that so that we can uh, be ready to go. Uh, so anyway, it is my great pleasure today to introduce our um, speaker, who is Dr. Edward C. Davis IV. Um, he sent me an excellent little biography that I'm just going to kind of go through here to introduce him. Uh, so from 2010 to 2018, Edward C. Davis IV directed Africana Studies for City Colleges of Chicago, based out of the West Side Health Sciences Campus, uh, Malcolm X College. Davis also taught anthropology and chaired the Department of Social Sciences. And in 2014, he became the youngest tenured professor in the state of Illinois. Davis has also taught in the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Mississippi, New York City, Paris, and the Brazilian state of Amazonas. Uh, anthropological research carried Dr. Davis to the Philippines, Haiti, Angola, Switzerland, North Quebec, and Canada, and Germany. Davis earned a BA from New York's University Gallatin, from New York University's Gallatin School of Individualized Study, an MA in African Diaspora Studies from the University of California at Berkeley, uh, a master in philosophy um, in anthropology at uh, the University of Cambridge as a member of St. John's College, and a PhD in African American Studies at UC Berkeley. Uh, and his dissertation there was titled Beer, Blood, and the Bible, Economics, Politics, and Geolinguistic Praxis in Congo, Angola. As a Chicago native, Dr. Davis remains true to his grandmother's maroon roots along Illinois' Trail of Tears Highway and Pope County's Underground Railroad in the Shawnee National Forest. Davis descends from Saponi Indians and Angolans from 1619 Virginia. And these days, Edward chairs the Angola Partnership Team a committee under the United Church of Christ Illinois Conference. Uh, APT rebuilds post-war medical, educational, and agricultural infrastructure at the request of the Igreja Evangelica Congregational M. Angola and the government of Angola. And since January, uh, Professor Davis has been teaching African-American studies at Southland College Prep High School in Richland Park, just south of Chicago on the historic Salk Trail. Um, and uh, Dr. Davis joins us from Southland, um, where some of his students are watching as well. So uh, his talk today is called A Trilogy in Africana Anthropology, Geolinguistic Praxis Service, Maroon Epistemologies, and Moral Ethical Logic. So Edward, with that, uh, if you want to share your screen, um, I'll let you take over. And also make sure You're, to unmute your mic. <laughs> yes. Okay, uh, let's see. I had my PowerPoint here a minute ago. It was just there. And now it's gone. Where could it be? Okay, am I sharing my screen right now? Not yet. Not yet. Okay, let's see. So well a minute ago. <laughs> okay, it was there a minute ago. And uh, now I think I'm sharing? Yes. Okay. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, sorry about that glitch, that computer glitch uh, for a second. Okay, so I want us to just look at the title for a bit. It's a complex title. Trilogy in Africana Anthropology, Geolinguistic Praxis Service, Marine Epistemologies, and Moral Ethical Logic. So thank you 
Ken, thank you, Rita, thank you, Yolanda, for that great introduction. I'm humbly honored to give this 2021 keynote lecture for Black History Month. And I want to thank the entire Field Museum staff, especially Christopher Phillip and Yolanda Wilhite. They were very kind to me in 2019 uh, to my students uh, at a different school where I was in 2019. Uh, and also uh, they were helpful when I brought uh, representatives from the country of Angola uh, through the Angola Partnership Team. Let's hope we can repatriate some of those artifacts back home to Congo, back home to Angola, and also teach Black Chicagoans of the powerful significance of those different objects. So I'd like to dedicate today's lecture to my living grandma, Doris T. Davis, uh, and to my deceased maternal granny, Dorothy Lee Stocksdale. True to their names, Dorothy and Doris, they are two gifts from God. So I wanted to put this up for a minute by al Haj Malik Shabazz. Education is an important element in the struggle for human rights, and it is the means to help our children and thereby increase self-respect. Education is our passport to the future. For tomorrow belongs to the people who prepare for today. Armed with the knowledge of our past, we can with confidence charter a course for our future. This is in a museum in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, usually people just take that one part, education is a passport to the future, but not all of what he says, but not the next set around that. So in recognition of Black History Month, this presentation examines my research in Africana studies and Fourfields anthropology, which has produced three critical theories for problem solving in these COVIDian times since 1619. Over two decades, my field work and activism and research and teaching career uh, have really looked at geolinguistic praxis service, GPS, ME, or Maroon Epistemologies, and Moral Ethical Logic, MEL. With geolinguistic praxis service, uh, this is explained in detail within my dissertation, which you can click on that link or later if you'd like to. I'll explain the depths of GPS uh, later in, in another slide. Maroon epistemology really comes from family knowledge from Illinois Shawnee Forest Underground Railroad. Uh, my uncle Dennis often says uh, our family has our own black history, uh, which is separate from the sort of US uh, stream of, of, of history, of even black or even white uh, American histories uh, that are told. And then moral ethical logic uh, is very key to what I do. Uh, as far as the curriculum that I've designed so far, uh, from scratch really, at Malcolm X College in 2010 on, and then uh, the textbooks that I'm writing at the moment. So GPS, ME, and MEL build upon schools of thought from theorists before me. My Berkeley mentor, Laura Nader, offers contrarian anthropology at St. John's College. Cambridge professor Sir Jack Goody left us non-Eurocentric pro-Black historical comparative analysis in anthropology. And meanwhile, Boazian cultural relativism introduced or influenced, I'll say, Zora Neale Hurston, the anthropologist. And if pioneering anthropologists Franz Boaz and Bronislaw Malinowski were trained physicists, which we know, then their mentees, Zora Neale Hurston and Jomo Kenyatta, provide a continuum from, from physics to anthropology and into black studies or Africana studies. We recall anthropologist Zora Hurston as the Harlem Renaissance scholar, and we remember the anthropologist Jomo Kenyatta as the first prime minister and president of Kenya, father of this nation, and the father of the current president, Uhuru Kenyatta. Yet, uh, if we return to GPS, ME, and MEL, it becomes necessary for me right now to clarify and state the origins of my philosophical methodological paradigms which emerged together probably as early as the age of three back in 1985 or so. But even further back, I'd say to Angola and Appalachia, Ohio Valley, five or 10 centuries or even more. So some essential questions we have to ask ourselves, how do we repair the past? And what are reparations? How do we get reparations? Is it a check? No, it's much deeper than that. Uh, especially if we consider that buck was black people, a black buck, or the guinea was a currency, also a black person was a guinea, 
right? So black people are the money. So giving money to money, it's not so logical. You have to do something other than just financial reparations. I'm gonna return at the end to Mazulu Diabanza Siwalemba, uh, a Congolese activist in Europe. Is Mazulu Diabanza correct in the way that he is repatriating things from museum archives, Kebukong Yi in Paris uh, and other museums across uh, London and in, in the Netherlands as well. So I will uh, pose uh, a question. Uh, the ultimate problem, I'd, I'd say, rather, let me pause back here. The ultimate problem lies in the bifurcated nature through which most people see the world divided as us versus them. And with GPS, ME, MEL, uh, these paradigms don't consider the world enlightened by dualisms or binary oppositions, us, them, but really operating within a space of the maroon. Uh, where whiteness or Eurocentricity don't enter into the ontological space of the maroon, which separates GPS and ecological universal MEL, moral ethical logic. And for that matter, the opposite of those things, being whiteness or Eurocentrism, become blackness. But for maroons, we see blackness as universal humanity. All humans come from Africa, and thus maroon epistemologies resemble quantum mechanics or physics of black holes or black space which contain white holes. They're never the other way around, right? Whiteness exists within blackness. Yet we also have to consider uh, deeper questions, uh, not just of assimilation or whatnot, but really deeper questions overall, moving away from these binaries that we all know. So with my company, Ulonio GPS Incorporated, it's a registered Illinois corporation and the theoretical paradigm shift for intergenerational knowledge transmission derives from the Angolan Ubuntu language, meaning knowledge or intergenerational knowledge. Uh, and it is global and local to produce anti-racist development anthropology in action. And it's separate from the Angola partnership team uh, with United Church of Christ, Illinois. I had hyperlinks here uh, that I was gonna click on, but that might be problematic in this short period of time. Uh, the Angola partnership team is on the US side of the United Church of Christ Illinois Conference as a subcommittee. Uh, there's also uh, our partners in Canada. Uh, this Angola partnership team and the Igreja Evangelica Congresso now in Angola uh, date back to 1879 when African Americans from Virginia uh, and British Canadian abolitionists were opposed to Portuguese slavery and went to Angola. Many of these uh, U.S. African Americans from Virginia were the grandchildren of people who had come from Angola. Uh, and so they did establish that church, which was very much opposed to Portugal's rule, and the Portuguese were very much opposed to those who uh, were, were championing education and uh, agricultural sustainability and also uh, continuity of indigenous languages back in the 1870s, 1880s. So for my own work and my own self, I look at global and local service through applied anthropology. Ethnolinguistics and religions are very important in my research for developing and designing social science curriculum. Cultural revitalization is very essential in consulting and the anti-racist policies that are implemented in the curriculum. Global ecological sustainability matters a great deal, especially with agribusiness and pharmacological medical anthropology. I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, perhaps you can't, uh, but this, uh, the first photograph, uh, upper left, uh, you see a map of Angola, uh, but it's in uh, Afrikaans. Uh, so it's, it's sort of translated from Dutch there. Uh, I'll be coming back to that image, that map. Uh, to the, next to that, I have, uh, actually you'll see these better in the next slide. So I lived in the Democratic Republic of Congo for two years. I was teaching at the US Embassy School uh, in 2006, 2007, 2008. And on one road trip I took with some friends, I went to the Bakongo region. Uh, this is a road saying, La province de Bakongo par son territoire du Kasangulu. Vous êtes la bienvenue. The province of Bakongo from the territory of Kasangulu wishes you welcome. And to the left, this is the former president, uh, Laurent Desiré Kabila from 1997 to 2001. Uh, he says in Kikongo, 
Tutunga in Sietu, we can build together. So what is geolinguistic praxis service? What is geolinguistic praxis service? Don't know if my screen, uh, some of it is cut off on the side there on my screen, uh, but it's four fields of anthropology of participant observation that transcends geopolitical boundaries and ethnolinguistic hegemonic forces of STEM with non-Eurocentric perspectives. This involves geological and geographic knowledge with focus in agriculture. Uh, analogy is the anthropology of wine. I actually did a, a wine study institute in Switzerland that taught me about the ge geological uh, components and minerals of the soil, which I translated that back into the Congo Angola region. Uh, looking at gastronomy, of course, but physics, pharmacology, and outer space, even uh, those minerals. Uh, whether it's the uranium for the atomic bomb or the minerals used to get to outer space, uh, even what we use in Tesla automobiles today and what SpaceX is using to go to outer space. It comes from uh, your coltan and other minerals, uh, uranium and other minerals and resources from Africa, from Latin America, from the Southern Hemisphere, especially around the equator. With maroon epistemologies as a dynamic theory, this is rooted in Antebellum before the Civil War, Southern Illinois, Saponi, Maroon, and Melungeon lineage on Illinois Route 146, Trail of Tears Highway, in an area which became the Underground Railroad settlements in Shawnee National Forest. Hundreds of my cousins trace our origins to uh, Native Americans and to, and to the Angolan King Dago Gowon via 1619 Virginians. With moral ethical logic, uh, I use deductive reasoning and multi-faith lineages to produce a continuum from physics to anthropology to Africana studies. Uh, some of it centering on my education at Humanian Christian School on Chicago's South Side. I'll give you a scenario in 1988 uh, when I was there, kid first grade, and it'll be very interesting. Uh, and then uh, I, I think of my parents, they're both black pharmacists and pharmacology, pharmacist rather, were tend to be like the most trusted profession in America. Uh, and so I think of this, this ethic of doing right by everyone at the absolute lowest cost, right? <laughs> lowest cost to farm or anything like that. So what then is this GPS, geolinguistic praxis service? So uh, this really came together for me, GPS really firmly in 2016. I had been teaching at Malcolm X College and I was gonna go back to UC Berkeley to complete a PhD, to take sabbatical uh, after like, seven years at, at Malcolm X College. And I had dreamed about going to Angola when I lived in Congo for those two years, I could get to the border and look, but I wasn't allowed a visa, even though I had ancestral roots there. And so uh, in this July, August trip of 2016 to Angola, we went through, if you can see, I don't know if you know, my cursor doesn't show up, so we went from the coast from Luanda, which is kind of a salmon pink color. We went into Bengo and Kwanzaa Sul, Kwanzaa Norte, and into Malangi province, and a little bit into Bia before we got into Lunda Sul. And we spent a good amount of time in Malangi, Malangi city, uh, which around 1620s was ruled by uh, Njinga, uh, Ana de Souza. Uh, and then we went into Lunda Sul, met the governor in Lunda Sul, and then up to Lunda Norte. And what you're seeing here in Lunda Norte is uh, the director of the Universidad de Luegia and Cond. Luegia and Cond was a queen who founded the Lunda Empire around the year 1500. And then the secretary general of the uh, Evangelical Congregational Church in Angola brought me there. He led the, the delegation for us. And he, he knew that I needed to go to Malanji. And he took me to Lunda Sul in the North where I wanted to do some work with this anthropology department uh, there uh, in Dundu, at the Dundu Museum. Most of the Dundu Museum has been uh, pillaged and the belongings that should be there are in places like the Field Museum and the Art Institute of Chicago or all over the world. Uh, but Reverend uh, Andre Kangovi Orico uh, Secretary General there uh, is an extremely uh, amazing person. Uh, being with him in those weeks there, it was like uh, sitting at the feet of Dr. King, Nelson Mandela, Desmond Tutu, 
all in one person. He's a really amazing person. And so uh, here I am uh, with my mother uh, shaking the hand of the governor. Uh, at the time, she was the only female governor in all of Angola. Uh, governor Dora Candida is her name, Candida. Uh, but I want to play this video. This kind of hit me on the return drive back to Luanda. <laughs> Good morning, Angola. So that was just one of those powerful moments. And I thought, wait, I'm, I'm actually here. I've been trying to get here since I was like three years old. And I thought, you know, hey, there's something to this Southern Illinois uh, where we, we have our family reunions. There's something to this, this Trail of Tears Highway, you know, where these three black people were living. I said, I figure I could, I could get us back to Congo and Bola. I could do that as a little kid. And then it happened uh, when I was like 32, 32, 33 years old. So uh, how does this trail of tears have anything to do with this? Uh, if you look here through Southern Illinois, you see how the trail of tears passed through. Uh, and our family, my grandmother's family, uh, has these reunions down there. And uh, on the right, this is the Superman statue in Metropolis, Illinois, uh, or on the left, rather, on the left. And you see my cousin, uh, Gwen Colley, uh, and then Wendy Freeman. And I realized as a kid, Freeman, that's the family name of some of our family named Freeman, but it marked their free status having escaped from slavery uh, into these collection of underground railroad towns. And Southern Illinois University actually uh, excavates some of our ancestors in Miller Grove in a cemetery. Uh, it's it's kind of gruesome. This is probably why I chose, to, one of many reasons why I chose to become an anthropologist. Uh, but on the right side, this is a photograph of my paternal grandmother's father. Can you see which one looks the most like me? So the first guy there, that's uh, Levi Hill, Jefferson Levi Hill III, my, my father's paternal grandfather. Uh, and then you see his siblings there, his siblings and cousins and so forth that he's watching over. And there were more black or brown or, or Melungeon or colored people. Uh, in 1920, in that school district, Sumner School, uh, then there were the four uh, white people and the two white teachers, uh, but mostly everybody was a Hill, a Hill of Sutton. Uh, so this is a picture of me as a little kid, uh, about four years old, 1987-ish uh, or so, with my father and his father and his father, the four Edwards. Uh, but that's not the line of my family that I'm tracing uh, in this. Uh, it's, this is actually my grandmother. So if you see me, and then you go back to my father, and then to his mother, uh, both of our mothers are named Doris, right? uh, Doris Davis, Doris Davis, Doris Johnson, Doris Hill, and then to uh, my grandma Doris's father, Jefferson Levi, Levi Hill, the little kid you saw there, and then his mother is down here in the bottom, Strosha Newborn. As a kid, I thought, oh, Strosha Newborn, she must have been Polish. Uh, well, maybe her grandfather was Polish, and he became Black, very interestingly, in the Underground Railroad coming to Southern Illinois from Florida. He gets classified, though he's a, a white Polish-American man, he starts to be uh, classified as Black in different legal documents. Uh, and even these, these marriage licenses that would pop up, uh, they show uh, my two times great-grandmother, Strosa Newburn's parents, on her mother's side, Eliza Mendley, it shows her parents, uh, Marilla Goins and John Mendley, as dark, but no race, 
So Melungeons, those from Melungi, Angola, being Melungeon and Saponi Indian mixed race people, they, they were not categorized or in some sort of paperless state where they didn't have to have papers. Uh, and then they were welcoming people. Uh, I, I assume anthropologically uh, in kinship terms that they needed children for their children to marry. So they welcomed lots of people in the underground railroad towns and consumed lots of different people to, to be in their, their different underground railroad villages. So from Marilla Goins, I get to Mahila Goins, uh, her one or two times great grandfather, Marilla Goins. Uh, and if you read the 2021 New York Times bestseller, it came out about three weeks ago, it's called 400 Souls. If you look on, I believe it's page 31, um, it's the, the book is edited by uh, Ibram X. Kendi and by, uh, by Ibram X. Kendi and Keisha Blaine. And in a chapter written by Dr. Nakia D. Parker, she chronicles 1654 to 1659. She lists uh, my hill goings, M-I-H-I-L-L. Sometimes I've heard it as Michili, right? Michili goings. Uh, but uh, my hill going, she calls him, and then his wife, Prosta, and their son, William going. On page 32 of 400 Souls, it's a, it's a book of about 80 or 90 essays written by about 80 or 90 different academics and scholars and public intellectuals. Uh, but yeah, in that 1654, 1659, uh, my nine times great grandparents are listed there in that. Uh, but that's, uh, I have to question how that comes together, but it does not mention my Hill Goins parents, Margarita or Margaret and John Goins. I call her Margaret Goins instead of Margaret Cornish because Cornish could have been her English rapist uh, who impregnated her. Uh, her husband was John Goins uh, and from his father, King Dago Goinwalong, who died in Bavaria, Germany. Uh, but Dago Goinwalong would have been a governor or king or something of that status in BA, in Bongo, Malangi, and Bengala uh, by 1618. So uh, back to my cousin, uh, Wendy Freeman, at the Sutton Hill Family Reunion down in Brownfield, Polk County, Southern Illinois, which is right next to Gallatin County. How would I go to the Gallatin School at NYU and uh, of individualized study? Gallatin, Albert Gallatin follows uh, Alexander Hamilton uh, as the Secretary of Treasury in the United States. And he has counties and streets in Jackson, Mississippi. There's a street, Gallatin Street, and then there's Gallatin County in Southern Illinois. So you look at these names that have all of these relations to Garden of the Gods, Shawnee Forest in Southern Illinois, the Underground Railroad, the Trail of Tears that are all overlapping histories. Yet we don't learn these as overlapping. We learn these as separate, right? Trail of Tears is over there. And the Underground Railroad is over there, right? We don't learn these histories as coming together uh, to unite us as one American people. This is a list in 1846 of family members uh, that came from Florida, the Suttons that came from Florida. Uh, and if you want to know more on that, you can go to lucysutton.com for legal history on my family's underground railroad routes, uh, written by uh, the website is maintained by Terry Franklin, my cousin. He's a, a lawyer of trust and estates. Uh, he's he went to high school with uh, Michelle Robinson uh, at, 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 uh, at uh, Whitney Young High School, and then later went to uh, law school, one class behind Michelle Obama, one class above Barack Obama. And I mention that because it matters in this uh, moral ethical logic, right? So, um, I'll just read this. <laughs> so in uh, 2020, a Mellon Fellowship took me to the Margaret Walker Center at Jackson State University, and it helped me to develop moral ethical logic as a theoretical paradigm in my textbook writing. But as I was there, uh, I was thinking of Margaret Walker, uh, sometimes called Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander, Professor, Mar Margaret, Professor Margaret Walker Alexander, Reading through her essays, I was trying to ascertain how the Playboy magazine writer, Alex Haley, 
uh, and certain, certainly the entire media world plagiarized Margaret Walker's 1965 doctoral dissertation and her 1966 novel, Jubilee, in order to write the fictional story Roots, which has so much power with us as African-Americans. Uh, one decade later, Roots came up. Uh, the Jackson State College uh, newspapers announced Haley's arrival in 1971 as a minor visit in the Black Studies Conferences uh, that Dr. Margaret Walker Alexander had convened. However, we know that Haley went to the Walker Alexander home. He ate Margaret Walker's gumbo and collard greens, and he lifted countless lines from Jubilee. But that was a, Jubilee was a true game changer from the gone with the wind sort of stories. And it centered Walker's maternal grandmother's maternal grandmother. And that line uh, through uh, antebellum Civil War and Reconstruction American historiography. And uh, if you watch Roots though, separate from Jubilee, uh, when Alex Haley played by James Earl Jones goes to the University of Wisconsin uh, to get assistance from the Belgian historical anthropologist Jan van Sina, uh, I wonder what they discussed. What did Jan van Sina tell uh, Alex Haley to do? So uh, while I was quarantined in Mississippi, uh, in 2020, I listened to a 2013 StoryCorps interview featuring my elementary school principal, the Reverend Dr. L.K. Curry. Uh, and in that interview, I didn't realize that Dr. Curry had gotten his PhD at Berkeley. I thought, oh, wow, that's interesting. Uh, but he started to talk about uh, being a friend of Dr. King in the days of Morehouse College, uh, playing baseball with Jackie Robinson uh, in the Negro Leagues. And then this October 1988, when a community organizer came to our school, came to Emmanuel Christian School on 83rd and Damon. And for me, it was quite interesting because I started to remember being the line leader coming down the stairs and seeing this uh, tall guy who looked kind of like a younger version of my own father and his like cousins uh, in Southern Illinois. Interestingly, Ann Dunham does descend from John Punch, who's one of the 20 and odd from 1619 Virginia, Angola. But in 1988, Obama uh, asked Reverend Curry if he could hear me, uh, like, like talk to me. I was six years old and I read from these uh, short stories I was writing. I was having these troubles tracing. I didn't realize the, home, the classwork they had us to do was tracing. I thought it was reading. So I would read the little six paragraph, six sentence paragraph thing. Aesop fables that were not right. They were bizarre in the way this textbook company wrote them. And my dad used to read to me at night, so I, I, I was reading. And so I would turn the papers over in class and I would write my own story. I was like, I think I'll write my own story that fits better with these characters and things. So I read those short stories to Barack Obama and uh, Mr. Obama and Reverend Curry were talking October, 1988. And they were saying, yes, Dukakis is gonna win. Governor Dukakis is gonna win. And I said, actually, Vice President Bush is gonna win. I've never been wrong about an election since then. I didn't really like care about elections, but I even in 2015 predicted two impeachments. In 2015, I predicted two impeachments for the candidate, uh, Trump. And even up until election day 2020, I said, no, they're gonna be two impeachments. Uh, you can check my, my social media feeds and all that. Uh, Knox College professor Yannick Marshall has written about Maroons as clairvoyant, right, for giving up uh, in some ways. Uh, last Juneteenth of 2020, he had a great article on this, uh, to bring the Maroon to the forefront of African-American historiography. You see Maroons in popular uh, movies like Eve's Bayou, even in Jubilee by Margaret Walker. She wrote about uh, Maroons, but it's, this is not a very well-explained concept. But in my conversations and interviews in Haiti, with the Chef Supreme or Grand IT of Voodoo, uh, Max Gesner Beauvoir in 2015, he confirmed uh, his clairvoyance. Uh, and Max Beauvoir was a patented physicist and biochemist. Uh, his daughter, Rachel Dominique, uh, Rachel Beauvoir Dominique, uh, is a trained anthropologist from Oxford University. She curated a field museum exhibit on Voodoo in 2015 which was there at the time that I, I went to Haiti to, to do some research, unassociated with the Field Museum, of course. Uh, and 
I have to then conclude that this maroon epistemological clairvoyance has to do with our connections to our ancestral lands and their spirits. While most people who live here, wherever here may be, remain foreign to the social space and the geophysical place, to the uh, horticulture, to the animal life, uh, in this idea of somehow the Western human is superior to the terrain. And as active agents within the racial capitalist scene, as the Berkeley trained political scientist, Dr. Francoise Vergès has articulated, the racial capitalist scene, racial capitalist scene as this epoch or period of the last six centuries where European expansion greatly destroyed uh, the global environment with racial classifications and economic exploitation leading to geological devastation and climate change. Human rights and ecological rights are thus inseparable. We can't consider these to be separable. So why Malcolm X and George Washington? So when I was leaving Mississippi in September of 2020, uh, I was still on this like writing philosophically about moral ethical logic, right? And I had some examples of this. I had a few and I thought, yeah, this is moral ethical logic. Yeah, these examples of things, especially what millennials are writing. Then I learned a professor at George Washington University had been plagiarizing two decades of my work. She stole my multilingual global research on Angola Maroons. She stole German translations of work that I did uh, that, that someone else had written. Uh, Beatrice Hintz had written some work in German and I translated it into English. Uh, and this, this person stole that, copied syllabi I created for Malcolm X College which the Illinois Community College Board had approved when they were used across the city colleges of Chicago campuses. I feel bad for Chicagoans who spent money at George Washington University to take classes with my plagiarizer when they could have just taken those same courses, a fraction of the price. But more disappointingly, my plagiarizer began her dishonest deeds with a 2001 essay I wrote after a candlelight vigil in the Bronx for Amadou Diallo at the site of his 1999 murder. Research I concluded in 2005 on anti-African discrimination in Belgium with comparison to Chicago housing and transportation discrimination included youth sports tournaments as remedy. In her capacity as chair of HNET Africa, my stalker hacked my computer using my 2005 seminar paper for her 2011 mockery of Angolan post-war basketball unity. But I should note, Two sociologists, Belgian sociologists who now work in Belgium and England, uh, turned my work into two more papers on Chicago red line discrimination and the Matongi XL African enclave that I have been researching since 2002, which is a neighborhood in Brussels. What I've been hoping to do was help the Teviren Africa Museum just on the, on the outskirts of Brussels in the Flanders uh, territory, Flanders uh, region. Uh, literally across the street from, from Brussels. I was hoping to get some of those archives and some of those materials uh, repatriated. It's like a cemetery, really. There are even dead bodies at the Deviren Museum uh, just, just, just outside Brussels. Yet with uh, all of, all of uh, this person pretending to be Black and Latina and receiving hundreds of thousands of dollars in salaries and hundreds of thousands of dollars in research grants from Fulbright and Social Science Research Council at the University of Wisconsin, where she was mentored by Jan Van Sina and many other people. Uh, they uh, were able to publish work that I originally researched and that blocked my own authorship or it also uh, shows you uh, just how little moral ethical logic, MEL, there is in academe where George Washington, university professor, could steal from Malcolm X College, university professor, George Washington steals from Malcolm X. I even uh, had to recall though, I had forgotten about this person. I had lunch with this person in January of 05 with a hundred people at a conference for black and Latina prospective PhD students at Berkeley. Uh, and I saw this person looking very out of place. And I said, you know, I'll just talk for like five minutes. Uh, and I didn't know that I would get my computer hacked. And I believe she was even stalking me while I lived in Congo for those two years. Uh, very mentally unstable person. Uh, but today as I work on writing projects, I run my firm, Ulonio Dual Linguistic Praxis Services Incorporated, which exists separate from the Angola Partnership Team. Uh, 
and from all the other different projects that I do. So back to Malcolm X, right? Education is our passport to the future. How do we then get this education, right, is an important element in the struggle for human rights. Education is what's gonna give us reparations, right? So I'm thinking to myself though, my, my sisters uh, on the left, uh, Tiffany, Patrice, and Yale, uh, I do this work for them, for my nieces and nephews, for my cousins, ex extended family. On the right, I see a very, very distant relative of mine, K.L. Knightley. Uh, this was in uh, Hampton, Virginia in August of 2019. We were uh, pointing out our, our links to Margaret Goins, Margaret Cornish Sweep, uh, and John Goin and Diggle Goin along uh, as being cousins. Yet I consider the work that I did uh, at Malcolm X College, this in curating one of the many different history walls. Uh, I wrote the, the words below there and put this uh, there. When you walk into the atrium space, uh, this is all there for you to see. Uh, there's another set of history walls just across from that that I curated and uh, put together. So I ask, uh, is Mazulu the Abanza right? Who is he? Let me share a short video. Of him. I'm still sharing, yes? Okay. Yes. Okay, now let me mute myself. Let's see, I'll just play it. I don't want to take up time. Hopefully there's not an echo. But Mazulu Diabanza says, uh, no one has the right to come and take these uh, items. Uh, he is, well, you'll see. Nul n'a le droit de venir prendre ce qui appartient au peuple africain parce que c'est notre patrimoine, c'est notre richesse. Et ceci a apporté des millions et des milliards à toute l'Europe. Euh, Moi, Zulu Diabanza Siwalimba, j'ai initié ces combats, ces combats de dignité pour la récupération de notre patrimoine, de nos objets d'art, de nos œuvres pillées. What's always interesting with me in this very recent interview, even the buildings behind him have this zigzag sort of like what you'll find in Fendi or Gucci kind of art designs, but this, this is Cuba. This is Cuba. This is African, Central African, Congo. Dans cette histoire, qui est le voleur? Le voleur, c'est celui qui soustrait quelque chose de façon frauduleuse. Or, moi, je suis l'héritier légitime, héritier biologique, administratif, identitaire et culturel de ces patrimoines. Dans aucun musée du monde aujourd'hui, on peut trouver euh, un titre de propriété vrai. Parce qu'au-delà du vol du piège, ils ont fait aussi l'usage de faux. Ils ont euh, utilisé des faux documents prouvant qu'ils sont propriétaires. Now, to my knowledge, only one item has been returned from France. It was a sword. Uh, I don't think anything else has been returned uh, from uh, what President Emmanuel Macron said he would return. That was the only thing. Uh, so let's see. I want to finish up the remainder of these. I was going to discuss the Moana Po. I don't think we have much time for that. Uh, these are very dynamic, sacred masks that have to do with the balance of gender. Uh, among Selunda Chokwe people of the region of uh, Lunda, North of Lunda Sul uh, into, um, into Zambia, Angola, Congo, along that border area, which is an artificial border. Uh, but uh, on the left, this is an item from the Art Institute, which is owned by the Field Museum, which was collected around 1920, I believe. Uh, and some of those other artifacts at the Field Museum, I did bring uh, members from the uh, 
the ECA and the Ministry of Culture of Angola who saw those items. This on the right was given to me uh, while I was living in Congo. Uh, and this is also a Mwana Po, Mwana meaning child, Po meaning woman, but these are worn by males at their male initiation once it is over, around 14 to 21 years old, really to give honor to their mothers, grandmothers, uh, and this uh, balance of matrilineal and patrilineal descent. I was going to show one quick video. Uh, we may or may not have time. Do we have time? It's about one minute long. Of the Lunda Chokwe Lusona algorithmic proverbs. These are very fascinating. And I wrote about this in my dissertation. And I do share these with uh, students uh, as another form of education. Let's start over. A Chokwe story of the beginning of the world. The figure at the top is God, at the left is the sun, at the right is the moon, and at the bottom is a human. The Lusana represents the path to God. One day the sun went to visit God. God gave the sun a chicken and said, return in the morning before you leave. In the morning the chicken crowed and woke the sun. When the sun went to God, God said, you did not eat the chicken I gave you for supper. You may keep the chicken but return here every day. That is why the sun circles the earth and rises every morning. The moon also went to visit God and was given a chicken. In the morning the chicken crowed and woke the moon. Again God said, you did not eat the chicken I gave you for supper. You may keep the chicken but return here every 28 days. That is why the moon cycle is 28 days long. The human also went to visit God and was given a chicken. But the human was hungry after such a long journey and ate part of the chicken for supper. The next morning the sun was already high in the sky when the human awoke. The human ate the rest of the chicken and hurried to see God. God said, I did not hear the chicken crow this morning. The human replied fearfully, I was very hungry and ate it. That is all right, said God, but listen, you know that the sun and moon have been here but neither of them killed the chicken I gave them. That is why they themselves will never die. But you killed yours, and so you must die as it did. But at your death you must return here. And so it is. Now, what's very interesting- The Tachak Way story of the beginning- What's very interesting is that there are dozens, hundreds really, of these uh, Lusona algorithms, these Lusona uh, pathways, Sometimes we could call these early in paths, uh, but that's with the European name, right? These predate early in uh, paths in mathematics. And so uh, what's very uh, disturbing, I'll say, is how the Portuguese and the Belgians and the British eradicated just Lusona algorithmic uh, proverbs and writing systems. Uh, but then you can go elsewhere, think of Indinka symbols from Ghana amongst the uh, Khan uh, people speaking tree and so forth. How are those languages not able to captivate what they did for thousands of years in mathematics that is taught at Dartmouth College? You can learn about uh, Lusona at Dartmouth if you're a computer science uh, STEM tech major, also at um, Beloit College, Wisconsin, the University of Michigan, at Michigan State University, and many other places. So how is it that we're not teaching African-American youth indigenous African math? And when I've done this, people catch on instantly, especially with how to create the paths without ever lifting a pencil. Uh, so let's see, I believe I closed out my PowerPoint, uh, which I did not mean to do, but it's pretty much done. So thank you. All right, uh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, one question that we have received so far um, from uh, Amira Ash Ashraf O'Neill. Um, there are so many levels to this webinar. Thank you for your studies and insights of clairvoyance. What is the name of your book and when will it be published? Ah, so uh, for my 2018 dissertation, uh, I have, it's called Beer, Blood in the Bible, Economics, Politics, and Geolinguistic Praxis in Congo, Angola. And I'm revising this, uh, so these are trilogies, three books. I'm revising that to be beer, bleach, blood in the Bible. Uh, I'd originally included bleach in a 2006 uh, version of this. Uh, 
but that will come out from University Press of Mississippi, uh, hopefully sometime in 2022. Uh, so yeah, Beer, Blood, Bleach in the Bible uh, in 2022 under University Press of Mississippi. Uh, and then for the textbook, uh, it should be called uh, Global Revisions in Africana Studies or Global Revisions in Black Studies. I'm using elements of that in my teaching here at Southland College Prep. I wanted it to be a college text or a high school advanced college text or somewhere in there. Uh, I was working with a publisher in Iowa, e, e publisher, but I'm moving uh, into a different format. Uh, also, it would be available for what we have now with everyone doing everything online. Uh, and then Maroon Epistemologies would be probably the third book in that series, very much, third book in that trilogy, and very much. Uh, autobiographical, uh, and we'll see who publishes that. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, a follow-up question is, can you partner and create a children's book for three to six-year-olds? I think I could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I could. I have taught uh, first grade K-5, uh, so I, I could take that knowledge from sort of uh, can differentiate it, yes. Uh, so just one quick uh, kind of uh, heads up to everyone. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, Yolanda has been um, uh, adding a number of like really good links and things to the chat. So um, please keep an eye on that. Um, let's see. So I guess uh, Yolanda or Rita or Matt, do any of you have um, questions for Edward? Yeah, um, I just want to start off saying I think it's really amazing that you were able to go that far back in your lineage. That's hard for anybody to do, um, and especially for um, the Black African American community to do. And not just go back, but actually pinpoint you know different communities, pinpoint different ancestral ties, um, and 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 where you are currently now to this day. Um, I think it was also kind of cool that. Uh, you went through and mentioned the Underground Railroad. Not many people still know that it came through Illinois. The Calumet area is a huge spot for Underground Railroad, uh, railroad activity um, that we're just now really kind of putting on the map in many ways. Um, but also talking about um, uh, the Trail of Tears and, and, the, and the interconnection between African and indigenous uh, peoples. Uh, so I think that was really interesting that you were able to to trace back your lineage that way, uh, I'm just I'm just curious as you were doing so. How long did it take you to 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 do this? I mean, how long did like for you to find these names and these dates and these people and these towns? Uh, was it what was the process like? You know, so uh, those branches of my family came together in the 1840s, and they've been living down there in Polk County. And uh, my grandma says she remembers in the 1940s family reunions after World War II being like an annual thing, either there, Columbus, Ohio, or different places where, uh, so I guess as a little kid, I we would leave Chicago and we'd go there, there'd be like these Amish buggies around and I thought, wait, am I going back in time? So it was like a, a real kind of zone to get there, to get to, you know, the Ohio River in these caves and all of that. But when you go there, the, the, the roads are like Hill Road and this road, like every family member you can imagine, the Crims and the Suttons and the and the New Burns and every, they have like different plots of land or streets or something. And so in that sense, I didn't, uh, I always figured it could happen. And once I got to college, I started piecing the things together uh, with some classes. I took a couple of classes with Sylvia and Doof in 2001. Uh, she's written on Maroons. I remember telling her, I think I'm a room. She said, no, you're not. I said, okay, I guess I'm not. And I never brought it up again, uh, but uh, I am, right? I am a maroon. So I had to really piece those things together. But maroons and melungeons, melungeons are more your, uh, your outliers that are close to the general population of, 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 of or also European American colonizers. And the uh, melungeons are really in the hinterland, far out. And excuse me, maroons. Maroons are far out. Uh, let me back. My family are sort of out there in the hinterland in southern Illinois, right? 
but you have these groups called Melungeons, uh, and I'm a member of the Melungeon Heritage Association. I joined in 2016. Uh, these are descendants of those 20 and odd who do their DNA testing. They come up to be like some 12% Black and 5% Native American, whatever percentage they uh, And they're like the, the, the uh, Goins and, and, and uh, uh, Mullins is a, a popular name among Melungeons. Uh, uh, lots of different names. But, I, but they're in like Big Stone Gap. Uh, Vardy, Tennessee, Big Stone Gap, Virginia. And uh, those areas, uh, they aren't sure of their identity. They think they could send from gypsies and all sorts of other things. But I guess there is multiple ancestry, but then the Angolan is what the Melungeon was. But I guess to make a long story short, um, it just kind of came to me. I feel like the ancestors wanted me to do this. What Max Beauvoir told me, the head of, of Haitian voodoo in 2015, uh, he said, uh, I didn't choose voodoo, voodoo chose me. It's the other way around. And I don't practice voodoo, but I remember thinking to myself in that moment in 2015, March of 2015, you know, was he unlocking as this physicist, the patented physicist and biochemist, was he unlocking these powers of white supremacy and so forth that had been stealing from me, right? And stealing my ancestry, my lineage. Uh, and from that point on, these opportunities began to shift and change for me uh, in terms of the, the knowledge just coming to me. Uh, cousins who are Harvard trained lawyers who just happened to go to Florida and get a whole set of court cases and just had like files of, of our Florida roots. And then cousins, uncles just, saying, hey, I did DNA tests, uh, and now analyze it for me. Or, or people just coming to me about it, I didn't go ask, they came to me. Uh, so uh, I believe when we are in the right uh, zone, then uh, we're able to access and, and receive those powers of the universe. Or the universe. So uh, I have a question that I, I had. Um, so in the talk, you mentioned how different histories or different historical traditions are kept separate and when really they are overlapping things. Um, how do you think we can better integrate those different histories? Um, and maybe particularly because we're, we're at a, a museum, at least virtually today, um, do that in a, a sort of museum context? You no, know, it has to really move away from this sort of uh, like I think of the Oxford Pitts Rivers Museum where there's this like way in which the material culture is laid out in some sort of uh, evolutionary sort of mode, which is highly problematic, right? We have to really move away from these Eurocentric paradigms. And we have to really focus on what these material are or mean or what, they, what these stories could mean for those who actually made the items and not for those who are the outsider telling the story uh, as the conqueror, the colonizer. Uh, I'm, I'm reminded of uh, one of the presidents of China going to Australia sometime back and he's saying in, in the 1400s when we came here to Australia and people in Australia, especially Australians of European descent thought, wait, what? Chinese people were here? Well, obviously it's right there. So why wouldn't they have been there in the 1300s, 1400s? Might have been a reference to Zhong He, right? The, the, the Chinese Muslim navigator, Zhong He. Right? So if we tell these stories that are real human stories, we have to really consider moving away from those paradigms that were necessary evils of evil 100, 200 years ago of, of, of white supremacy and domination and, and, and theft and murder, right? And now we're in a new state a new state of mind, a new realm of being where we can't really say, um, let's continue to do things like they were in the 1850s or the 1950s. We can't do that in 2050. So we have to completely create a maroon epistemology. We have to completely create a new way of thinking that is not foreign or alien and it's not left or right, up or down, but it is truly autonomous maroon space that recognizes the place in which these things happen, right, in situ. And you need to include people 
poor from those places. All right, so we are just uh, coming up on time, but uh, just to, to do one more question. So an anonymous attendee asked, uh, first of all, I wanna say great presentation. It was very informative. Uh, what is your opinion in regards to the hash AODS slash FBA, so Foundation of Black Americans movement? There are individuals within the African-American community that want to change the name from African-Americans to either American descendants of slaves or foundational Black Americans. Um, but the individuals within the movement made a statement that Africa slash Black Americans are not descendants from Africa. Um, so any thoughts on that? You know, I don't speak for ADOS. I, I'm, I'm not a member of ADOS. Um, I'm a Maroon, right? Very independent in that sense. But I very much understand what they're saying because it is very much, uh, there is a, a, some levels of truth in what they're saying, especially as uh, there are differences in the ways that American descendants of enslaved people uh, would be treated uh, in this world. I mean, the evidence of myself uh, being plagiarized by a white Jewish woman from Kansas City, Missouri, by right, pretending to be black, uh, yet there was something in this artificial Dominican Bronx, whatever identity, right, which was, which was, uh, I don't know, right. Uh, when I go to Haiti, when I go to Guadeloupe, when I go to places where I, where I am, I'm respectful of the place and of the terrain and of the space. Uh, and so uh, I believe with the ADOS movement, there's a hope for that. I don't know if the hope is to be uh, completely inclusive, but then there has to be a recognition that U.S. African Americans, I say that term, U.S. African American, that's the term I used when I was overseas, when I didn't want to be some uh, classified as Black British or Afro-Caribbean British or something of that nature. Uh, so I, I would say U.S. African Americans, or I would also say uh, 1865 Negroes, those descended from 1865 Blacks or from 1807 Blacks. You forget about these rules of 1807, uh, ending the transatlantic slave trade by the British, and then those who were indigenous who did not own enslaved people were then able to be enslaved in what became the United States. And I hope that is where ADOS uh, is looking or focusing in this, this uh, 1619, 1807, 1865 realm where there is a great deal of indigenous group uh, among US African-Americans here before 1865. And uh, so we have to really look at that mixture of African and indigenous, yes. It's a very critical thing to do. Okay, thank you everyone for coming today. And uh, Dr. Davis, thank you very much for your, your excellent talk. Um, we really appreciate you taking the, the time to share your insights today. Um, and so that concludes our uh, Armor Seminar content for uh, Black History Month, but be sure to uh, keep an eye on the Black History Month website for some of the, the final events and things going on um, at the museum uh, in the last few days of February. Um, so thank you everyone, and uh, hopefully we'll be able to see each other in person soon. Thank you very much for this excellent opportunity. I appreciate it a great deal. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Rita. Thank you, Yolanda. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone else. All right. Thanks all.